station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston, this is station. We're ready for the event. Bloomberg TV, this is Mission Control in Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Ryan Chilcote with Bloomberg TV. How do you hear me? Bloomberg TV, International Space Station. We've got you loud and clear. Fantastic. What an honor and a pleasure. Welcome to Ryan's Russia. I understand I have all six of you uh, on board up there right now. Ryan, you almost do. Oleg's uh, busy flying the space station. He's still hard at work, but we've got uh, five of six. <laughs> Someone has to fly the space station. <laughs> that, that's very excusable. How does it work up there? I want to ask you. There's six of you. It's a big station, right? Do you, uh, do you work in separate areas? Are, are some areas segregated, Russians only, some areas Americans only? How does that work? No, absolutely not. But it's a great question, Ryan. Uh, we've got uh, we we do often talk about there being two segments: there being the U.S. operational segment and the Russian segment. When in fact, this is one space station, one crew, and uh, we're um, supported and uh, and the space station is largely operated by control centers all around the world. But uh, from the perspective of the people that live and uh, and work aboard space station, this is one big team. <laughs> Was that a mosquito? He was just. Uh knocking down there. What, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't ask what, what that was. <laughs> so in terms of the size... No, no, the no station, mosquitoes up here. Thank <laughs> in terms of the size of the station, do you find yourselves bumping into one another? How, how big is it and how often do you interact? Uh, we bump into each other every day, all day long, and station is big, but it is amazing how often we'll all be working in like one cubic meter out of the thousand cubic meters that are up here. And it's just, it's just one of the facts that happens that you'll have one rack and there'll be a set of experiments and, and at least three of us will be working all around this one rack. And how do you divvy up the resources? I mean, I know sort of six grown men, two bathrooms, right? One on the American side, one on the Russian side. Do you uh, share bathrooms? What happens if one breaks? A timely question. Uh, that, that often does happen here. And uh, we've got, I guess I would consider it, we have almost uh, two full baths or fully functional ones. We've got two smaller ones that are in the, uh, the Soyuz vehicles that brought us up here and will bring uh, each of us, crews of three, uh, back to the planet Earth. Um, we do spend a surprising amount of time keeping that hardware working and functioning, and uh, but it's important to us. And uh, when there's an issue with uh, with the one that's in Node 3, for example, then all of us use the one in the service module. And if there's an issue with that one, then we all use the one up here. But uh, no, there's no uh, no restrictions one way or the other. And you have like a maintenance schedule of some kind. I mean, uh, can, can you? Some, some, it's presumably the commander can pull rank and say, "I'm not going to clean." You don't want to run the risk of a mutiny. No, <laughs> actually, um, th there's not there's not uh, per se, um, you know, so much a dedicated maintenance schedule is a lot of the work that we do is on condition. So uh, if uh, if everything is working and humming along well, um, and we don't have to change out a component, for example, for every you know every three mo months or whatever the the duty cycle would happen to be on it, um, then things are fine. Occasionally we'll have a light, an indicator light that'll come on to tell us that there's an issue um, with one of the components, and we'll roll up our sleeves and we'll go to work and square it away. If you don't mind, if I could ask one of the cosmonauts a question, I want to ask about how you eat on board. Is that something that uh, you do separately? Do you invite the Russians over? Do they invite you over? I mean, is it sort of uh, freeze-dried borscht on Wednesdays? Uh, thank you for a good question. Uh, we live here uh, like one family, and we try to help uh, to every one of us if we have uh, time, of course. Um, uh, we have uh, maybe not a lot of uh, time, but we have a time uh, for to 
be uh, together maybe during the uh, supper or during the weekends um, we have a um, dinner together we speaking about our um, problems about our family uh, of course uh, on the earth and uh, we we can see uh, interesting uh, program or movie together uh, what else one of you celebrated your 40th birthday Thanks. up there did you have a big party Uh, yes, we, uh, we had uh, two uh, uh, same parties of uh, uh, birthday parties, uh, me and Anatoly uh, here on board. Uh, it was a beautiful time because we uh, were on altitude, uh, 400 kilometers uh, over the Earth. It's like maybe record in the world. I, I think, and uh, we had a beautiful party with uh, beautiful uh, songs of our commander, uh, Daniel. He played uh, guitar, uh, beautiful songs, and we had a um, uh, nice food. It's like uh, strong coffee, uh, beautiful tea, uh, and something, snacks. Uh, it was a great time. I got to ask you, give me a, and I, give me one thing that you think Russia does better when it comes to space flight, and one thing that you think the United States does better. So we're, we're, that's a it's an interesting question, Ryan. There's there's a there's a lot of aspects to it. If you look at just the day to day and the kind of things we interact with, stuff that that uh, would seem trivial sometimes, maybe on on planet Earth, there's certain ways that we package uh, food um, on the on the food that comes up via the the U.S. assets. There's uh, uh, different kinds of food that come up. So food is one thing. There's a lot of difference. We actually share quite a bit across. Um, um, across the hatches, so to speak. I think if I were to look at it more globally, though, the thing that, that Russia brings to space exploration that a lot of us are newcomers to is just the experience of long duration space flight. How do you live and work? How does a, um, a human being stay up here and operate for six months at a time? How do you keep the hardware working for, for th those kind of uh, you know, durations? And on the U.S. side, we have, we're, we're relatively new to this. Um, the European Space Agency astronauts, many of whom have already been flying and have a lot of experience on the Mir um, for long duration as well, um, probably already have a lot of that background. I think we tend to make things um, on the U.S. segment, tend to, things tend to be very, very intricate, very, very sophisticated, sometimes maybe at the expense of easy maintainability, I guess I would say sometimes. We're learning a lot of great lessons here um, on the modules that are forward of uh, PMA-1. Let me ask you about the Soyuz, because that's the way up to the station now. I wanted to ask you, um, you know, I guess this is your, you, you all came up now on the Soyuz. It must be very different than the shuttle. Okay. Um, obviously, the, the thing that's um, that's most evident to all but the most casual observer is the Soyuz or any capsule-based space spacecraft is uh, quite a bit smaller uh, than the space shuttle is. So, from the perspective of of, uh, of riding aboard, the space shuttle has a lot of room, and uh, and it was a very different ride. On the on the Soyuz, it was much smaller. Now, with that said, capsules are a very elegant and uh, and straightforward way to get to to low Earth 
Earth orbit and also to return to Earth. Um, for me, it was great to have had the experience to fly in both types of vehicles. Uh, Soyuz affords us the, the opportunity to have a vehicle to act as a lifeboat for the entire duration that we're up here, for all of the six months. If there happens to be a serious emergency on board space station, in a matter of minutes, each of us, all of us, will get to our respective Soyuz and those vehicles be ready to return Earth in uh, real short order. So that's, a, uh, that's kind of a dual purpose aspect to those and, uh, and a very important one for long duration flyers. I want to ask you guys, what should, the, uh, what should the next frontier be when it comes to space exploration? Not NASA's view, not the Russian space agency's view, but your own personal views. Maybe a couple of you guys could share. I mean, is it Mars? Is it the moon? Is it a base on the moon? Is it an asteroid? Is it more of what you're doing now in low orbit? Well, I think uh, all three of them uh, are going to happen. Uh, I mean, everybody looks always at the, the, this moment and, uh, and the budgetary problems of the next half year. But in the long run, uh, humans will spread th through the solar system. And uh, uh, I think the asteroid is a very interesting uh, topic. I, I never thought about that uh, uh, before it came up. I think that's a very, very good one. Uh, but for sure, we will have base on the moon. There will be, there will be uh, mining on the moon. We will get... Uh, great sources uh, of energy, we will use the solar energy more, and then we will go to Mars. The problem is when, I always say in 25 years, but I said that 25 years ago as well, and that's one of the things of space flight, we have to be very patient, but it will happen for sure. If, if you look at our state of technology, there's only about four general places we can go right now in space. We could do low Earth orbit, we could do something between the Earth and the Moon, and we call that the Earth, Moon, Cis space. We can do something on the Moon and possibly go to Mars. And, and th these are about the, the four general things that, that we can do right now or contemplate doing. And as far as I'm concerned, it doesn't really matter which one. You know, choose one, and the important thing is to choose one and stick with it for a long enough period of time so you can make some progress. And it takes about 10 years to make any progress in these fronts. So, so we have to choose one of these and roll up our sleeves and just work and work and work for about 10 years before we will see real progress on this front. Tell me about some of the traffic you've, you've got coming up there. You've got, uh, it's, be, it's being called the Cosmic Traffic Jam. You've got an awful lot of spacecraft coming up there over the next several months, don't you? Yeah, we sure do, and, and it's actually the lifeblood of Space Station. Uh, a lot of the cargo vehicles um, are key to keeping the Space Station operating and, and functioning. It's the the method uh, for us to return science, something we put the uh, shuttle to good use for, in addition to bringing cargo up here. Um, and uh, SpaceX, the Dragon, uh, their their vehicle, which uh, will launch, we hope, on uh, April 30th of this, uh, this month, will get, afford the capability of returning hardware from station. Um, we also have uh, a Progress Cargo, cargo Vehicle docked to station right now. It will uh, bring uh, trash back. Uh, it'll actually be incinerated on the way back through Earth's atmosphere. Another Progress vehicle is lined up to come here, and most importantly and most uh, immediate for all of us on board is very soon we'll have the European Automated Transfer Vehicle number three that's going to be docking on the aft part of Space Station here in a week. So you've got commercial spacecraft, you've got European spacecraft, you've got Japanese spacecraft, Russian spacecraft, um, the commercial from the United States. I mean, it, is that an indication that the times have changed, the old sort of uh, Cold War space race is long past because it's not just two countries, not just two spacecraft, but I mean, it's, you know, you guys are busier than, than Star Trek up there with the, all the spacecraft coming in. Yeah, I, I think, well, uh, we are already for a while in the in this international uh, era, uh, and I think that's a very good thing. I, I really like it to work one day in the Japanese module, then do something in the Russian module, uh, and uh, European, uh, American, that, that's very good. And I think we, we're getting into another new era, and that is the, the, the commercial space flight. So it, it's very interesting that, uh, uh, that the Dragon uh, is coming soon, and uh, that's that's the future, like, like with all kind of 
transportation we have uh, uh, on Earth. Uh, in the beginning, it's uh, it's it's new and it's some pioneers, and then uh, the companies take over, and agencies go beyond and do new things and then uh, continue with exploration. I think it's a natural process, and I'm very pleased that uh, that uh, I'm here now uh, when we start with it. SpaceX says they may have round trip flights to Mars for let me make sure I get this right, a half million dollars in 10 years' time. What do you guys think about that? That changes everything, doesn't it? I think if we can greatly reduce the expense of uh, getting things to low Earth orbit, it opens up in an unbelievable way uh, space uh, exploration for uh, many more people than have had a privilege to do this so far. And uh, I think probably all of us would share the sentiment that says the more the merrier. And, uh, and as soon as you can have uh, companies who are able to do this and be viable um, and uh, in the private sector, then it greatly, greatly opens up the possibilities for space flight. Um, like Andre said, I think it's important for the really hard, very, very tough things to be done probably by, um, by nations and by nations' space agencies and, and uh, ideally by nations working together. So th those are the big steps that need to be taken you know, on a big scale and they don't often return a, lot of in return a lot on the investments in the near term. As soon as we figured out the Earth to low Earth orbit piece, and I think we're getting pretty close to that right now, then the time is ripe for commercial uh, companies to be able to step in and take over that piece, and then the governments and the international space agencies will then take the next stride, and, uh, and I think that's great. And I think uh, the more vehicles that we have that are able to fly in space, the better it is for all of us. Now, a very important question. Uh, have you tried Angry Bird Space yet? We don't have any electronics up here that we can capable of playing it. Oh, no video. Yeah, game. yeah, it's too sophisticated <laughs> for. Uh, <laughs> it's too sophisticated for the space station, yeah. <laughs> and we are yeah. Bloomberg. Sorry, go ahead. Ryan, you're still with us. Yeah, yeah. Look, I'm sorry, I, I, I thought we might have lost you. Sure. We are Bloomberg TV. We were wondering, how do you keep track of your investments when you're so far away? Yeah, we're all uh, looking at each other saying, what investments? Um, we, the folks that, that fly in space generally don't do this to become, to become uh, rich. And, uh, you know, the, the, the richness we have is in the opportunity to do this. So, actually, I don't really think a whole lot about it and uh, don't, uh, don't really have a whole lot uh, in that. Maybe down the road sometime. But uh, for me, my focus has been, you know, working in this business and uh, working with this, uh, this great team that we have on board and, and with all the wonderful folks, smart folks that are on the ground that make it possible. Uh, one last quick question. When you look and I think our biggest... Uh, I was just saying, I think our biggest invest in, uh, investment is our families, and uh, that goes well. One quick question. When you look out the window, everybody wants to see, obviously you can see Earth. I think we only got about 30 seconds. Uh, you can see what other planets, asteroids, space junk. Well, what do you see out the window? Well, the thing that, that really captures your uh, the view is uh, the planet Earth. I mean, it is spectacular. It is just beyond description, at least beyond description for somebody like me. And uh, But with that said, you can see stars that are just brilliant points of light that do not twinkle. You see comets. You see other satellites and spacecraft. And uh, But your eyes are always drawn back to our home, planet Earth. Oh, that Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you for joining us on Ryan's Russia. You be well. Ryan, thank you. It was a pleasure talking to you today. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. Bloomberg TV, Space Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications.